need a barn burner sermon now. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. So we are in this series where we are reading through the Bible together, and um, you all got to Romans this week, and if you've given up because you hit Romans, <laughs> hang in there, hang in there. I'm going to give you the key to understanding Romans, and it'll make it, it'll make it easier going forward. So we are going to hear from uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 22. Hear now the word of the Lord. The promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would inherit the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. If they inherit because of the law, then faith has no effect and the promise has been canceled. The law brings about wrath. But when there isn't any law, there isn't any violation of the law. That's why the inheritance comes through faith, so that it will be on the basis of God's grace. In that way, the promise is secure for all of Abraham's descendants, not just for those who are related by law, but also for those who are related by the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have appointed you to be the father of many nations. So Abraham is our father in the eyes of God in whom he had faith, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that don't exist into existence. When it was beyond hope, he had faith in the hope that he would become the father of many nations, in keeping with the promise God spoke to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Without losing faith, Abraham, who was nearly a hundred years old, took into account his own body, which was as good as dead, and Sarah's womb, which was dead. He didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise, but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes that we might see and know the word you have for us this day. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So when I was in high school, I was part of a group that competed in Arkansas Model United Nations. It was my 10th grade year. It was the very first time that I had competed in Arkansas Model United Nations. And imagine this, we were assigned to be the representatives of South Africa. Yeah. Now this is South Africa back in the days when Trevor Noah's existence was illegal. This was when apartheid was alive and well, when it was illegal to be black, basically, when they were oppressed. And I had the challenge. This was also the year we invaded, well, South Africa invaded Namibia. So we were were sort of in everyone's line of sight for those two things, the invasion of Namibia and apartheid. And I had to defend our government's position. I had to stand there, and and I, I couldn't quite say that apartheid was fine. <laughs> what I could say was, we are a sovereign nation, and you cannot tell us what to do. And then behind the scenes, in good political maneuvering, I bribed everybody who has a nuclear power because South Africa has most of the world's uranium. And I was up for best delegate because I did my job really well. I had a lot of struggle in that space. And, and looking back, now I'm, I'm somewhat fearful that someone will find the, the video cassettes because we were... You know, that's how we record. Well, they will find the video cassettes of me defending myself before the General Assembly, um, me defending South Africa. And they'll take that out of context. They'll think that that, those are my beliefs. Those are not my beliefs. I was playing a role. Context really matters. Context makes a difference. And with the letters especially, as we are reading through these, it is critical to stop and reflect on the context. And it's it's important for us to remember that we're reading someone's mail. For an equivalent, we're reading somebody's email. 
for today. And in fact, we're maybe even, if this will help, we're reading an email that someone hit reply all to that they didn't mean to reply all to, <laughs> right? Paul, as big of an ego as Paul had, Paul never thought he was going to end up as scripture. He didn't think 2,000 years later we would still be reading his words and trying to apply them to now. He was writing to very specific moments and very specific contexts. And there is some good and timeless advice in the letters, but there is also a great deal of advice that was meant only for that time and place. But how do we, how do we figure out which is which? Well, key to that is understanding the context. That helps us sort it out. So I'm going to give you pieces of the context of the letter to the Romans. There are three pieces that are important to know. One is where Paul was in this moment. One is what Rome was going through in this moment. And the other is to understand some stylistic things about how the letter is written. So first, Paul is writing, this is the one letter that we have of Paul's that is written to a bunch of people he has never met. Most of the letters that we have are written to churches that he either helped found or he founded. And he's writing to them after he's left them and, and a problem has arisen. And he's, uh, he's, as the founding pastor, giving them some advice. But Rome, he's writing to a bunch of people he has never met. He knows some of them from context we'll talk about in just a minute here. But for the most part, he does not know these people. This church was founded maybe by Peter, um, but not by him, certainly. And he's specifically writing to them, one, to help them understand who he is. He is defending his reputation um, that as the apostle to the Gentiles, because there are all kinds of rumors floating around about him. And he sees himself as particularly suited for writing to the Roman church in this moment of time that they're in. But he wants them to understand that he is both a Jew and he believes that Gentiles are fully included in the family of God. And he's laying that out. And he's defending his, this theology of inclusion and grace and faith as well. He's defending who he is. He needs them, not only because he thinks he can be helpful to them in this moment, but he's also going to ask them to help fund the rest of his mission. So this is a letter of introduction in that sense. Now, it's important to understand this about Rome, um, to understand a very significant political reality that was happening in Rome. In um, about 49, um, Claudius, who was the emperor, got tired of the, um, the rumble that was happening in the Jewish community over what was written in letters, the issue of Crestus. Now, we think that they meant Christ, but the Romans were kind of barely paying attention, right? They're like, there's a bunch of stuff going on in the Jewish community. It has something to do with some guy. Um, and, and we need them to settle down. So Claudius's solution to get the Jews to settle down was to cast them out of Rome. So the Edict of Claudius, which was passed in 49, cast the Jews out of Rome. They had to leave. If you were Jewish, you had to leave. If you were a Gentile following Jesus, you didn't. So the Roman church didn't fall apart. The Gentiles stayed behind, kept it going, kept growing it, while their Jewish friends had to leave for five years. Now just imagine that. Imagine this part of the room got kicked out of Bentonville for five years, right? And this part of the room went, all right, well, we'll keep things going. And then five years later, this part of the room shows back up and says, all right, we want to do some stuff now. And this part of the room goes, well, now, wait a minute. We've been running things around here. We, didn't, we kept things together, and you come in and you want to have some ideas? This is what's happening. So the Gentiles have created this space, and the Jews who founded the church have come back and said, all right, we want our place back. And they're like, um, where have you been? I mean, I know you had to leave because of the emperor, but come on now. So, so they're fighting with one another in this church about all kinds of things now. Who's going to be in charge, what their theology really is, um, what, what it means to be included. They're fighting about all of those things. And that's what we see in these first four chapters 
of this letter. Remember that Paul was a trained scholar. So he's going to use classical rhetoric to build an argument that he needs them to get on board with. And so basically what he's doing is in chapters 1 to 3, he's presenting the Jewish complaints about the Gentiles and the Gentile complaints about the Jews. Now this does two things. One, it helps build some rapport with both groups. The Jews are like, yeah, he really gets us. He knows. He, he's a Jew, too. He gets us. He understands what our objections are. And the Gentiles are like, yeah, but he really is the apostle to the Gentiles. He clearly understands what we're going through, too. But the thing is, is he's setting both of these arguments as what's called a, a straw man argument. But in this case, it's a double straw man. And if you are unfamiliar with the straw man, the straw man is you present your opponent's side in a way that it's easy to tear apart. Like, it's just made out of straw, right? So he's presented the Jewish perspective, and he's presented the Gentile perspective with the intention of tearing them both apart. Because in chapter 4, he says, yes, you Jews may have these objections about the Gentiles, and you Gentiles may have these objections about the Jews, but you're missing the point. The point is, Let's go all the way back to Abraham. And Abraham was what reckoned righteous when he agreed to leave and follow God. And that was before the circumcision. And that was before the law. And then it was Abraham's belief and faith in God that made him trust that he would have heirs even when it was impossible to have heirs. And it was that righteousness, that righteousness of belief and trust in God that defined who we are, that made the family of God, that predated all of this stuff that we're now trying to hold over one another. It was that common faith, trust in the promise that God makes us all into family. That God brings all nations together. Abraham may be the father of Judaism, but this journey started before that in that moment of belief. And that moment of belief includes all. We all become part of this family, not when we're circumcised, not when we follow the law, but when we believe and receive God's grace and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes every one of us a child of Abraham. That makes every one of us a brother and sister of Christ. That makes every one of us brothers and sisters of one another. And that's what Paul says. Paul says that God wants us all in the family. And to give up these things that are dividing the family. Jews quit holding the law over the Gentiles. Gentiles quit judging the Jews for the ways that they have been. Quit fighting about these differences that are largely cultural more than anything else when what we have in common is a love and faith in Jesus Christ. And the great tragedy is that these very chapters are being used against brothers and sisters in Christ. These very chapters are being used to level against one another. These very chapters stand to try and divide us once again. And what heartbreak there is in that. That again we've missed the point that we are all included, that we're all brothers and sisters, that we're all part of this family. We have tried to make more babies illegal. We've tried to restrict the family tree, this salvific family tree. This most inclusive letter has become justification for exclusion. I want us to remember the point.
point of knowing the context is to find the truth that still applies to us. And the truth that still applies to us is that we are family. We are all included. And friends, in, a, in an era when division is what is on the news, when division is what we hear about about our church, when division is all around us, when we're, we're encouraged to level words against one another, I want us to remember this day who we really are and who we really are are the people that take soup to you when you're sick. And they're the people that hold the hands of people in hospice. We're the people that pray for people we haven't seen in months, but we know we love them. We are the people who put arms around the grieving and weep with them. We are the people who celebrate or release someone from a prison of illness. We are the people who stand on the promise of the resurrection. We are the people who love through all things, in all places, in all times, in all moments, through all times of life, through every tragedy and every joy, through every hope and every loss. We are the people who never leave you alone. A few years ago, one of my uh, clergy friends went to a funeral for a woman who had been a saint in the church. And, and it was her and the pastor delivering the funeral. The woman had lived a long time. She had outlived most of her relatives, her blood relatives. But was she left alone in that moment? No. The church was there. The church was there. The church remembered her and celebrated her and loved her every moment of her life. Through her death. And will celebrate with her in the life that is to come. My friends, that is who we are. We are the people who will never be alone because we will always, always have our brothers and sisters in life, in church, and in Christ. Amen. As you all know, we've been working over the past few weeks on a campaign to eliminate the church's debt. You all are incredible. I want to say thank you um, for the generosity that you all have shown um, in such a short time. Through your generosity, we have commitments to eliminate all of this debt. That said, we have an opportunity to think beyond us to um, enjoy a church and a community that is thriving. Um, our finance committee is dedicated to managing a budget in a very responsible way. What it takes, what we need from you, is to continue to support the general budget. I know you've all done a lot. You've given tremendously to this campaign, to the general budget, but there's still so much to do if we want to be the church that gives to the community and thrives. It takes giving to the general budget, but it also takes giving your time. It takes going to Sunday school, and it takes just coming to church and loving your friends and your neighbors. We are those people. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this church. 
and I'm excited to see what we can do um, in the future. Lastly, again, I want to say thank you. And I want you to know that you've inspired me. Um, you've inspired our entire finance committee at your generosity. And it gives me great energy to think about our church in 2030 and living for God, living for our community, and living beyond us.